Hello students, today we are going to talk about the Mauryan pillars with the aim of understanding the construction and purpose behind the erection of these pillars. The Mauryan Empire is well known for its remarkable achievements in the fields of art, architecture, literature as well as culture. The Mauryan pillars are considered to be one of the key works as well as prominent features marking the Mauryan supremacy. These pillars till today stand as a testimony to the rich architecture which flourished during the reign of this empire. Ashoka ascended to the throne in 269 BC inheriting the empire established by his grandfather Chandragupta Maurya. Ashoka was reputedly a dictator at the onset of his reign. Eight years after his accession, he campaigned in Kalinga, where in his own words, a hundred and fifty thousand people were deported, a hundred thousand were killed and as many as that perished. After this event, Ashoka adapted to Buddhism in regret for the loss of so many lives. Buddhism then became a state religion, but with Ashoka's support, it spread rapidly. The inscriptions on the pillar described edicts about morality based on Buddhist doctrines. The Mauryan pillars or pillars of Ashoka, also known as Lats, are a series of columns dispersed throughout the North Indian subcontinent, erected or at least inscribed with edicts by the Mauryan king Ashoka during his reign in the 3rd century BC. Originally, there must have been many pillars, but only 19 survive with inscriptions. Many are preserved in a fragmented state, averaging between 40 and 50 feet in height and weighing up to 50 tons. Each, all the pillars were quarried at Chunar just south of Varanasi and dragged some hundred of miles to where they were erected. The significance of the pillar is not difficult to determine. The origin of the pillar as a structure goes back to the monolith of the prehistoric period. These were generally cut from a single block of stone and stood in an enclosure which was regarded as sacred. Sometimes they were worshipped as a phallic emblem or linga. The advantage of inscribing a text on such a pillar was that of associating the text with a place of importance. The Mauryan pillars therefore serve as the best examples of the use of art for the purpose of propagating religion through the medium of edicts inscribed on them. Leaving behind their Buddhist significance, the Ashokan pillars are expressive of a very ancient widespread belief and were in the first instance inspired by men worshipping among the grooves and great trees of the forest. With the reverence for trees came veneration for huge stone and boulders. The sacred and mystical character given to them being but a prelude to shaping them into upright forms. Columns were God in early days and the forerunner of the temples. Apart from this, the terrific level of craftsmanship itself speaks volume about the greatness of the Mauryan period. The highly polished, tall and well-proportioned columns with slightly tapering monolith shafts and standing free in the space and complete and independent by themselves are admittedly the best representatives of the court art of the Mauryas. The pillars set up by Ashoka furnish the finest remains of Mauryan art. Here, it is important to mention the evolution of these outstanding structures. 
possessed of great ideals as Ashoka's policy throughout plainly indicates, one of this ruler's most earnest desire appears to have been to institute permanent record of the establishment of the Buddhist faith within his widely spread dominions. A craving for a symbol of stability occurs in the early evolution of most nations, a need for some substantial link which holds them to the soil and is a stage in the development of racial self-consciousness. This thought might be the reason behind initiating the carving of his famous edicts on the living rocks, proclaiming as they do in plain terms that his efforts should result in the long endurance of the good law. These inscriptions, although may have survived, were not however sufficiently striking to suit his purpose. What was evidently in his progressive mind was the creation of a memorial of such a permanent nature that it would outlast the time itself. With this in view, he caused to be raised in many parts of his empire stupas, which were circular tamlai of bricks, sacred mounds commemorative of the Buddha. But as the stupa from the nature of its structure was subject to disintegration owing to the rigours of climate, it became necessary for the Mauryan Empire to seek for some still more lasting method of achieving this purpose. Aware, no doubt, that the other nations were using stone, he began therefore to think in stone. And in the course of time, an impressive monument symbolizing the creed was devised in the form of a pillar, a lofty freestanding monolithic column erected on a site especially selected on account of its sacred associations. A number of these Ashokan pillars were distributed over a wide area and a few bare ordinances inscribed in a manner similar to the edicts on the surface of the rock. Talking about the discovery, the first pillar of Ashoka was found in the 16th century by Thomas Coriat in the ruins of ancient Delhi. Initially, he assumed that from the way it glowed that it was made of brass, but on a closer examination, he realized it was made of highly polished sandstone with upright script that resembles a form of Greek. In the 1830s, James Princep began to decipher them with the help of Captain Edward Smith and George Turner. They determined that the script referred to King Piyadasi, which also was the epithet of an Indian ruler known as Ashoka, who came to the throne in 218 years after Buddha's enlightenment. Scholars have since found 150 of Ashoka's inscription carved into the face of rocks or on stone pillars, marking out a domain that stretched across northern India and south below the central plateau of the Deccan. These pillars were placed in strategic sites near border cities and trade routes. Material used for construction, these pillars are fashioned out of grey chunar sandstone and stand directly on the ground without any masonry platform or base. Having been kept in position by being simply buried in the ground, sometimes fixed to a socket hole in the middle of a large undressed block of a stone. The shafts, plain and circular in section, have each a slight taper upwards. Each is chiseled out of a single block of stone the capital surmounting it being of another piece and fixed on the top of the shaft by means of a copper dowel. The capital is divided in three sections, namely a double curved inverted lotus, commonly known as the Presipolitan Bell. Agarwal recognizes this motif as an inverted Purnaghata surmounted by an abacus or sockel that supports an animal sculpture or sculptures in round. The entire column 
with the capital is distinguished by a precision of molding and bears a finished surface, a highly lustrous polish, the composition of which is still a matter of investigation. Several moldings of variable designs are usually introduced to render the transition from the shaft to the capital easy and graceful. These columns or lats, though alike in journal form and composition, vary in the treatment of detail, particularly in that of the capitals. In this connection, it may not be out of place to refer to the possibility that some of these pillars might have been standing from before the days of Ashoka. This is suggested by the Rupanath and the Sasaram edicts and pillar edict number 7 where Ashoka says that rescripts of the law of piety should be engraved on rocks and on stone pillars wherever such pillars might have been standing. It is not impossible, hence, that the idea of edict pillars was first suggested to Ashoka by some pre-existing pillars which he also thought of utilizing in his new mission. Indeed, a closer examination of some of these pillars clearly indicates them as having been apart from the more well-known edict columns. The columns that bear the edict of Ashoka includes the two pillars at Delhi, originally located at Merut and Topra in Haryana and were brought to Delhi during the reign of Feroz Shah Tughlaq in 1356. The pillar at Allahabad is believed as originally located as Koshambi and the pillars found at Lauria Ariraj, Lauria Nandangar, Rampurva with Loin capital, Sankasya, Sanchi and Sarnath. The columns bearing dedicatory inscription were found in Lumbini and Nigali Sagar. The pillars found at Vaishali with single loin capital and Rampurva with bull capital do not bear any edict. The inscription are in Brahmi and Kharoshti, the earliest examples of deciphered scripts from India. The most important sculptural remains of the Mauryan period are the capitals and the crowning animal figures on the Ashokan edict pillars. Some of the pillar edicts were carved on already existing pillars as for example the Bahasra Bahakira ancient Vaishali line pillar where the workmanship is crude and rough. The location of this pillar is contiguous to the site where a Buddhist monastery and a sacred coronation tank stood. Excavations are still underway and several stupas suggesting a far-flung campus for the monastery have been discovered. This pillar is different from the earlier Ashokan pillars because it has only one lion capital. The lion faces north, the direction Buddha took on his last voyage. Identification of the site for excavation in 1969 was aided by the fact that this pillar still jutted on the soil. More such pillars exist in this greater area but they are all devoid of capital. On stylistic ground, the figures can be divided into two groups, the sophisticated but conventional line and the cruder but very powerfully modelled representation of the bull and elephant. The one at Basra Bakira marks the earliest stage in the development, probably it is pre-Ashokan. Compared with the other columns of known Ashokan dates, the shaft of this column is heavy and of a shorter proportion and its workmanship crude and rough. The plain square abacus which is by itself an almost sure indication of an earlier date has no integral relationship with the bell capital below and is moreover out of proportion. The crowning line recounchant though a free and independent figure is only rough and crude in execution but has not yet evolved a form and appearance so as to make of itself an integrated whole together with the shaft, the capital and the abacus. 
Further, the elephant at Sankasya and Rampurva bull illustrate the transition from the Basra Bakira line to Laurya Nandargarh capital. The Sankasya pillar itself shows an improvement in the change from a square to a round abacus, thus making the transition from the capital to the animal more harmonious. The decoration on the abacus and the manner of filling the space between the legs are rather primitive, probably copies of wooden models. The Rampurva bull capital shows stylistic similarities with the Sankasya capital. The bull bears a striking resemblance to those of the Indus seals. Though the technique is less sophisticated than in the line figure, the modeling and form of the animal appears vigorous. The volume following closely the anatomical details reveals keen observation of nature and understanding on the animal form. Unfortunately, this naturalistic representation of the bull does not harmonize with the conventional pattern of the abacus. The decoration on the abacus consisting of rosettes and honeysuckle appears a little rough. The line capital at Rampurva and Laurya Nandangar are chronologically close to the Rampurva bull capital. The Rampurva line capital resembles an inverted lotus with petals clearly marked. It retains some of the lustrous polish. A line of geese adorns the round epicus. The crowning statue on top represents a seated lion with muscles, veins and paws skillfully carved. The uniform curls of the mane shows the schematic repetition of the same design. The whole is represented in a conventional way. On the tall and graceful pillars of Laurya Nandangar, we see another seated line. This frequent use of line figure could be due to the fact that it symbolized one of the cardinal direction. The line seems to be uncomfortably fitted into the round abacus, with parts of the body projecting beyond it. The quadripartite lion capital of Sarnath and Sanchi mark the last stage in the evolution. Lion capital at Sarnath is most celebrated pillar erected at Sarnath by Emperor Ashok in 250 BC, also known as Ashoka Column. Here, four lions are seated back to back. At present, the column remains in the same place whereas Lion Capital is at Sarnath Museum. This capital consists of an inverted lotus with gently curved petals. On the round abacus above it are high relief carvings of a lion, a galloping horse, an elephant and a bull, separated from each other by a wheel. These animals represent the four points of the compass, the lion north, the horse south, the elephant east, the bull west, for the Buddhists believe them to be the guardians of the four cardinal points. In this abacus, they symbolize the continuous movement and unseeking progress of Dharma Chakra, destined to spread throughout the world. The freshness and naturalism of the animal figures on the abacus contrast strongly with the four conventionalized lines above. Sitting back to back on the top of the abacus, they echo the essential shape of the stylized locus. Though the rippling curls of the mane, the upturned whiskers and the shape of the lips are conventionalized, the snarling mouth and bare teeth look very real. The leg muscle and paws are powerfully modeled also and the carved claws seem to express all the native ferocity of the animals. Originally, the lion supported a dharam chakra, the remains of which are still visible on the backs of the animals. The lion heads with incised parallel lines representing the muzzle and eyes in a triangular shape resemble Persian lion figures. Though the sophisticated conception seems to confirm the Achaemenid influence only experience could have resulted in the advance to naturalism seen in these animals. 
the Sarnath Lion capital now serves as the emblem of Indian Republic. The Sanchi capital resembling the one at Sarnath is even more conventional and stylized. The higher and narrower relief of the abacus frieze eases the transition from the capital to the crowning figures better than at Sarnath. Again, the animals forming the crowning members of the capitals of the pillar are not particularly associated with Buddhism alone. Lion, either singly or in a group of four, appears on the majority of capitals, elephant on the Sankasya, bull at Rampurva and in a group of four at Salempur and horse at Ruminindi. These four are also represented round the abacus of the Quadripartite capital at Sarnath. Some scholars try to find a specific Buddhist association of these animals. Lion means the lion of Sakya clan. Elephant is associated with the legend of conception of Buddha. Horse with that of great renunciation. Bull to donate the Buddha. Bhu was often addressed as Muni Pangava or as Sakya Pangava. These animals are sacred to Brahmanism and to a certain extent to Jainism also. The Laurea Ariraj column, which is all probability was crowned by a figure of Garuda, may be regarded to have a distinct Brahmanical association. In this situation, it is difficult to consider these animal capitals in any sectarian context. The view of Agarwal seems to be more convincing. He identifies the lion, the elephant, the bull and the horse as the four noble animals held sacred in the Indian tradition for a long time past and for a long time after. Raising of such animal standards must have been common and it is not impossible to regard at least some of the Ashokan pillars as but translation in stone of the primitive animal standard. Talking about the elephant at Dholi, besides these animal figures on the pillar, another piece of sculpture, the elephant at Dholi, carved out of a living rock, strikes an essentially indigenous note quite different from the art traditions of the capital. The voluminous mass shows plasticity and knowledge of the animal forms. The slightly raised right leg and following trunk accentuate the animal's forward movement. Compared with this elephant, the lion figure seems too conventional. Stylistically, it does not come much later than the elephant capital at Sankasya. The unconventional Dholi elephant as well as the Rampurva bull and the Sankasya elephant seems to belong to different artistic tradition, perhaps that of Indus Valley. These animals form a not schematic nascent. Life seems to stir within them. This indigenous quality saw further development in the subsequent periods of Sunga and early Andhra dynasties. Thus, to conclude, we can say that these pillars are the masterpieces of modern art in the shining polish imparted to them, which is supposed to be the disappear of modern masons and in the degree of perfection in which they are shaped dressed and decorated in accordance with the emperor's design. They carried to a high standard the art of the delineation of natural forms of animals and plants in stone. They are also notable as feats of engineering when it is considered that all these pillars weighing on an average of 50 tons and measuring a height of 50 feet are all monolithic productions showing how large masses of rocks were shaped into these pillars and also these great weights were handled for the purpose of their transport over the distance of several hundred of miles to their appointed sites at which they were to be located in accordance with the imperial scheme of public welfare which they were intended to serve. For instance, a chain of pillars was called for to indicate the pilgrimage's progress towards the holy land of Buddhism from Patliputra to the place of Buddha's nativity. 
So, with this we come to the end of this lecture and I am sure by now you must have got a clear picture about the various Mauryan pillars. Thank you.